the tiniest unit of matter invisible to the naked eye a million times smaller than a human hair measured in nanometers but let the atom size not fool you for packed into this remarkable particle is an incredible amount of energy atomic energy that could power entire nations for the foreseeable future but extracting this energy for generating electricity is no child's play how can nuclear power be harnessed efficiently yet safely that's a question of science powering a country like india is a gigantic task for one of the most populous nations in the world the energy deficit between demand and supply is huge an estimated 300 million indians are without power and the country faces a peak shortfall of 10% this dire situation is only made more precarious by our dependence on fossil fuels for energy thermal energy derived from coal is our primary source of electricity it's a resource that will only last for so long the writings on the wall any attempt to bridge the enormous energy gap will have to look beyond fossil fuels it will have to be a long term sustainable solution for an ever growing population most importantly it will have to be non polluting and safe there are several contenders in the ring of these alternative resources one in particular has been developed by india since the very early days of independence no energy is costlier than no energy these were the famous words of homi bhaba india's most forceful champion for nuclear energy throughout the 1940s 50s and 60s he laid out a long term vision for india to become self reliant using atomic or nuclear energy but what exactly is nuclear energy for this we need to go back to the most popular equation in history albert einstein's e is equal to mc square the equation explains how mass and energy are equivalent in other words all matter has mass that can be converted to energy including the nucleus of an atom nuclear energy is the energy contained within the nucleus of an atom there are two ways through which we can access this energy nuclear fusion or joining two or more nuclei to make a single one and nuclear fission or splitting one nuclei into two or more products in theory both phenomena release incredible amounts of energy but in practice only one has been successfully and safely achieved to produce power nuclear fission fission has typically been conducted with heavy atoms found in the bottom half of the periodic table of elements it was first conclusively observed and explained in 1938 in germany scientists otto hahn lisa meitner and fritz strassmann studied what happened when uranium was bombarded with neutrons to their amazement the heavy nucleus seemed to split up and create the much lighter barium in the words of their chronicler otto robert frisch the uranium nucleus might indeed resemble a very wobbly unstable drop ready to divide itself at the slightest provocation such as the impact of a single neutron after separation the two drops would be driven apart by their mutual electric repulsion and would acquire high speed and hence a very large energy where could that energy come from using e is equal to mc square the scientists determined that the energy released was equivalent to the differences in masses between uranium and its fission products but just how much energy was this let's do a simple comparison to understand 1 kg of coal 
burns completely to give approximately 8 kilowatt hours of energy. In contrast, 1 kg of fissionable nuclear fuel like uranium-235 gives 24 million kilowatt hours of energy. Simply put, nuclear fission of fuels like uranium releases 2 to 3 million times the energy released by the burning of coal. It was this remarkable fact that inspired Homi Baba and others like Vikram Sarabhai to advocate for nuclear power. They designed a three-stage nuclear power program to harness the energy of the atom for India's consumption. The plan had one critical mission to gradually reduce India's dependence on sparsely found uranium fuel and instead use its abundant reserves of thorium. This meant that India had to develop technology different from most other countries which had rich supplies of uranium fuel. India would also have to go the distance alone, being isolated by other nuclear-capable countries for political and strategic reasons. This is the starting phase of the program in which we got all the knowledge and expertise with respect to designing reactors, setting up reactors and making a base for the nuclear reactor program. And so, the first of the three stages began early in India's life. It was called the thermal phase and it involved conventional nuclear reactors that carried out controlled fission reactions using uranium-235. Inside these reactors, uranium-235 is hit with neutrons splitting it into new products and free neutrons. These free neutrons hit other U-235 atoms, creating a chain reaction. The chain reaction is kept in check by moderators such as water, which control and slow down free neutrons to cause fission. The resultant energy is carried away by coolants like water to steam generators, which power the electricity grid. Over the last few decades, such thermal nuclear reactors have come up across various parts of India. They have also set the stage for the second phase in India's three-stage nuclear program, the fast breeder reactor stage. For transitioning from the first stage to second stage, a lot of elements of uh, R&D and technology development are involved. This is the site for the prototype Fast Breeder Reactor or PFBR. Coming up in Kalpakam in Tamil Nadu, this 500 megawatt power plant is a new chapter in India's nuclear story. Its USP, this reactor creates more fissionable material than it actually spends, thus drastically reducing the amount of uranium required. How does it do this? The answer lies in how the free neutrons are controlled inside the core of the reactor. Unlike a conventional reactor where neutrons are slowed down to create fission, fast reactors allow the neutron to move at high energies. While these fast neutrons may not be as good at fission as their slower counterparts, they are perfect to convert fuel like uranium-238 into fissionable material like plutonium-239. This plutonium can now be extracted, reprocessed and used as new fuel. But all this is easier said than done. The prototype fast breeder reactor has taken decades to build and has been an entirely indigenous effort. Long before the PFBR could come up, fast reactor technology needed to be developed and tested without any assistance from the global research community. This was a challenge accepted by the Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research or IGCAR. Indigenous development requires a full knowledge of how to fabricate these fuels. What are their properties? There can be chemical properties, there can be physical properties, there can be neutronic properties, all these have to be understood. They began their ambitious fast reactor program over 25 years ago in Kalpakkam with the Fast Breeder Test Reactor or FBTR. The FBTR is a nuclear reactor 
built specially for scientists to test out their homegrown fast reactor technology. This I will say is the mother of uh, all fast breeder technology in India. Though this was built with the French design to begin with, a lot of modifications were done at the design stage. Now we are entering fast breeder test reactors, reactor containment building. This is a personal airlock. Now we entered personal airlock of reactor containment building. At least one of the doors always will be kept closed. We are right now inside reactor containment building of fast breeder test reactor. We are just standing near reactor core. Reactor core is just 8 meters below this. It's the only unique reactor where we can stand on the reactor when it is operating at full power. The FBTR is a nuclear laboratory to experiment with fast reactor technologies. And when it comes to such technologies, it's a mix of fundamental physics, chemistry and cutting-edge engineering. So what do you need to build a fast reactor? You need the right nuclear fuel, the right moderator and coolant, and foolproof systems and components to handle volatile materials and extreme conditions inside the reactor. With these goals in mind, India's nuclear scientists got busy experimenting on the FBTR. When it comes to cracking the formula for fast reactor fuel, the indigenous FBTR is a standout reactor. It uses a special uranium-plutonium carbide fuel used as a driver fuel for the very first time. Fuel subassembly will be like this. It is, con it is a hexagonal can. Inside that, fuel pins will be there. Five, around 5.5 mm thick uh, outer dia fuel rods will be there. Inside these fuel pins, pencil-like fuel pins, inside fuel pellets will be there. It is cladded in stainless steel. Fast reactor fuel has not one, but two important jobs. It must undergo fission efficiently so that maximum energy can be derived from it. Its fission must also create enough new fuel that can be extracted by reprocessing it. Since the FBTR's uranium-plutonium carbide fuel is a new mix not used anywhere else in the world, its formulation has been challenging. To test its performance, continuous and rigorous tests are conducted on spent fuel that has been irradiated by free neutrons inside the reactor's core. This radioactive spent fuel is transported carefully out of the reactor's core and straight into the radiometallurgy lab's special chambers called hot cells. A hot cell is an enclosure where highly active materials can be handled safely with the remote operations so that people who are working in the operating area does not get affected by the radiation that is handled inside. So this uh, RML uh, radiometallurgy lab uh, hot cell facility is a uh, unique in India. It's here that the uranium plutonium carbide fuels properties are closely studied to see how well it has performed. So after the many years of tweaking the formula, what's the verdict on this unique fuel? Tests in hot cells have shown that the fuel can stay for a long time in the reactor and fissions into a high content of plutonium, which can be reprocessed and used. But what about the energy produced? How does the carbide fuel measure up? A conventional reactor gives an energy output of 7 to 8,000 megawatt days per ton of fuel. It was expected that the carbide fuel of a fast reactor would perform at 25,000 megawatt days per ton. But its actual performance exceeded even that. We planned for 25,000. From 25, we went to 50,000. From 50,000, we went to 100,000. And ultimately, it reached a burn-up level of 165,000 megawatt days per ton as against originally thought of a figure of something like 25,000. With the FBTR helping scientists to perfect the fuel formulation, it has also helped select the right oxide-based fuel for India's prototype fast breeder reactor. 
we have done this in the phosphate test reactor, we have confirmed that it perform performs to that level. So, that gives us a confidence about the second stage. So, this gives you kind of uh, R&D that is required for launching a fast reactor program. The FBTR has also been indispensable in other research areas where Indian scientists had to start from scratch, such as critical technologies to reprocess spent fuel from fast reactors. A test reactor is always a very exciting reactor because uh, basically it is an R&D tool and we keep on doing a lot of experiments, we keep on learning and every day is a day of learning in a test reactor. With India's first fast reactor getting its fuel formula right, the next big learning was selecting the right coolant. This requirement was fulfilled by liquid sodium. Liquid sodium is ideal for fast reactors like the FBTR and PFBR. It has excellent heat transfer properties to carry energy from the reactor core into the steam generators. It also has the ideal nuclear properties to ensure that free neutrons remain high energy in a fission reaction. But liquid sodium isn't so easy to tame. Look into the periodic table of elements and sodium can be found in the first group of alkali metals. Its atomic properties make it highly reactive and unstable in air and moisture. It can be explosive if exposed to them. It can also cause corrosive damage to other structural materials inside the reactor. Chemistry of uh, liquid uh, sodium with its structural materials is very much dependent on the uh, metallic impurities such as the oxygen and hydrogen. The sodium has got uh, solubility of oxygen and hydrogen in parts per million levels or even one tenth of the, uh, those levels. What do you see here in, in my hand? is a piece of uh, shiny sodium piece. In that, uh, it is packed in 1 ppm of oxygen. If 1 ppm of oxygen, the shiny surface tarnishes, you can see from here. So, the oxygen amount, if it is uh, more than uh, a couple of ppm, then it will lead to corrosion. So, when the sample is brought from the uh, various uh, sodium facilities, it should be brought intact, it should not get contaminated during transit. So, it is taken inside the glow box and then this, uh, the known amount of sodium is loaded in a suitable crucible and excess sodium is distilled off by induction heating and what is left out is the residue and from the residue we can analyze for oxygen or carbon and then various transition metal impurities by various techniques. Scientists here have designed state of the art sensors that can withstand the high temperature environment of fast reactors and keep a check on sodium impurities. But what about the reactor components themselves? How do they survive sodium's extreme nature inside the reactor for years on end? Ensuring this is the job of the Fast Reactor Technology Group's one-of-a-kind sodium testing facilities. So in these sodium facilities, actual reactor conditions of temperature, pressure, flow, everything will be simulated and the components will be uh, operated or tested and the performance will be evaluated and the performance studies will be carried out and qualify it for the reactor use. And not only the normal operating conditions, we will also simulate the transient or uh, off normal conditions in the reactor and the components will be qualified. So that way we will be very sure that when we send the component to reactor, it will perform throughout the reactor life in the desired manner or the required manner. What we are seeing behind is basically a 1 by 4 scale model of fast, uh, prototype fast Peter reactor. That, this means the actual reactor will be four times bigger than this. But we have all the full uh, components of the reactor here. And what we are studying here is the flow phenomena, means how the fluid will flow, the actual sodium will flow. The properties of sodium and water are identical. Not the thermal properties, but the hydraulic properties, means the density, is viscosity are identical to water. So the experiment, instead of performing in sodium, we can perform with water. While water can play surrogate to sodium for testing the component's hydraulic strengths, it cannot replicate sodium's extreme chemical nature. And so, 
each component must also endure testing in special sodium facilities. India is one of the few countries in the world to host state-of-the-art sodium testing labs. We have many facilities, almost a dozen sodium facilities to do different kinds of experiments. This sort of facility is where the full-scale component can be tested. Nowhere else in the world, I can say confidently. And even in fact, uh, other countries are trying to do their experiments of their interest in here. Although decades have gone into its research, fast reactors are new, not just to India, but also to the world. So along with the development of fast breeders, India also has an army of expert builders of nuclear infrastructure. Bhavani, or Bharatiya Nabakiya Vidyut Nigam Limited, has the lofty task of building fast reactor nuclear plants that will generate electricity for commercial use. And it's not just construction that Bhavani is tasked with. Its experts have worked closely with IGCAR over the years, perfecting the PFBR. They have been indispensable in giving feedback on how the reactor will perform once commissioned. In doing so, they've collaborated to transform theoretical and experimental concepts into practical reality. Once the PFBR is installed, Bhavani will then take over its complete operations. We have ensured that everything has been done as per systematically written prior uh, experience procedures. And with that only we have gone ahead and then started doing the work. Perhaps Bhavani's most important task is ensuring that the first time technologies of the prototype fast breeder reactor are absolutely foolproof and safe. The PFBR safety features address not just accidental situations related to radioactive or volatile materials, but any emergency situation that can affect the reactor and its surroundings, including natural calamities like earthquakes and tsunamis. At Bhavini, we can see exactly how these measures are put into action. Here, besides the PFBR control room, there is its twin version, an exact replica where future operators are trained extensively and rigorously using simulations. Every conceivable emergency is recreated to sharpen the skills, reflexes and protocols followed by those who will run the reactor. These procedures ensure that absolutely nothing is left to chance. This facility is a operator training facility, simulator training facility for the prototype fast beta reactor. Okay? This is the mandatory training for any operator who is going to operate the actual plant. So at this, in this facility, the operator will be evaluated for his responses to the emergency situation, for his response to the normal situation, how is his reflections, how is his response, all those things will be evaluated before actually giving license for him to operate the plant. 2014 is slated for the official commissioning of the prototype fast breeder reactor by Bhavani. With it, India will launch the second stage of its ambitious three-stage nuclear program. This second stage of nuclear power program will have many advantages over first stage reactors. It will be cleaner and produce less nuclear waste. It will produce more energy per unit fuel. Most importantly, it will bring India closer to self-reliance in nuclear fuel as it leads us towards the third stage involving thorium. Ultimately, it's the indigenous technology, it's the indigenous reactor and we have to bank on our own capabilities. We cannot stand in other shoulder. We have to be self-reliant. And the self-reliant reactor, the self-reliant power producing method is the fast reactor. I'm extremely excited and I'm very confident about it. It is going to be successful. Once commissioned, the PFBR will produce electricity for commercial consumption. It will be closely studied so that it can be replicated across the country. It will also pave the way for the third technological wave in India's nuclear story. 
and so for India's nuclear scientists, as one dream reaches fulfillment, many more wait in the wings, waiting to take shape. If you'd like to share your feedback on today's program, please send your suggestions and comments to Vigyan Prasar, C24 Kutub Institutional Area, New Delhi, 110016. Or you can mail us at info at vigyanprasar.gov.in.